for being here today. Um, as Don mentioned, <clears throat> we've kind of started to develop this nascent uh, pea breeding program. And we've also started to join this uh, pea breeding consortium, but I'm not going to really be talking about that much today. But uh, they've been really helpful collaborators and some of them are helping us get germplasm. Um, so as Don mentioned, Bob was originally planned to give this talk today, but due to a, a little bit of a scheduling mix up, I get to have that honor and privilege. So uh, thank you. And just, you know, maybe bear with me a little bit if I stumble here and there on the slides. Um, but yeah, here we go. So um, this project is really just getting underway. Uh, and so because of that, there are limited re uh, results to really present. Um, but for those of you unfamiliar with the project, Nick and I can hopefully give kind of a review of the projects and goals uh, of the breeding program and where things stand right now. So the long-term goal of this project is to develop a fully functioning pea breeding program that can develop varieties adapted to Minnesota. So the impetus behind this work is twofold. Uh, first, peas um, possess the potential to be an excellent alternative cover crop in Minnesota. So as a legume, it can obviously fix nitrogen, which improves soil quality, and uh, it can provide ground cover in the early spring to prevent erosion. Uh, and second, there's this growing demand for plant proteins in the U.S. and in international food markets, which could create added value for Minnesota growers. So this figure here is just one that I grabbed off the internet, uh, and it's just kind of showing um, uh, like a growth in demand for plant products, plant protein-based products over time. And I mean, I've, I've seen a bunch of different forecasts and estimates for where the plant protein market's going, but all of them indicate a really strong growth market over the next 10 or more years. And as an added bonus for peas, uh, they already have an established market. So compared to other kind of very new crops, um, that's not something that we have to build in as we develop this breeding program. There's already an established market. Uh, and additionally, there's already a network of researchers and potential collaborators and some work that's already been done to understand the genetics behind the crop and develop germplasm. So that's, you know, an added infrastructure that's already ready. So in this work, we face a few challenges. Um, the first is that peas are not the most winter hardy crop, especially when compared to some of the other more hardy grasses like uh, rye or wheat. Um, however, in talking with Rebecca McGee, it seems like there are a number of varieties which might work in Minnesota and further that there's genetic potential to actually improve um, for this trait. And just for you, for you guys who don't know, Rebecca McGee is a USDA pea breeder based in Pullman, Washington, and she's kind of like the main public pea breeder that's out there. So she's a pretty strong authority. Uh, and one of the main people who has given us germ problem to start breeding here in Minnesota. So a second challenge is that winter hardiness is a very complex trait that can be difficult to measure and select for. <clears throat> so we need ways to address that challenge. And Nick will go into this a little bit more in just a few minutes. And then the third challenge is that limited work has actually been done to isolate and characterize the various fractions of pea proteins. And so for breeding, this poses a challenge because if we don't have a clear metric for what seed traits are the most desirable, then it's hard to select for and breed those traits. So to address these problems, the grant laid out three primary objectives, which can help get this pea breeding program going. And these are the objectives as laid out in the grant. And as Don was alluding to, the first objective is kind of the most important, and that's getting a grip on germplasm that can survive in Minnesota and finding ways to assess and, and breed for winter hardiness. Um, in the grant, it was originally specified to develop spring and winter yellow pea varieties, which could survive in Minnesota. And so the plan was to simultaneously um, breed for winter hardiness and food quality in winter peas, and then food quality in spring peas. But after talking to people who are much more knowledgeable in the world of peas than ourselves, we've since moved the target a little bit. So for winter peas, um, 
we're also going to try to include green and Austrian peas just to expand the germplasm a bit more and hopefully have more targets for winter hardiness. From what I understand, uh, the genetics of the, the endosperm and sea coat color are not super complex. So once we have winter hardiness established, we can move back to yellow peas and then begin working on pea protein. But in the meantime, it's still okay, you know, we're trying to get winter hardiness, but the, those peas could still be used as an adequate cover crop if they survive and then also for forage. So they still have utility for the farmers beyond, you know, you know including winter hardiness. The second objective as written is to evaluate pea protein diversity and functionality for food industry uses. Um, but due to the cost of this kind of work and our limited resources, we'll only be able to examine a few varieties in depth, but there is an FFAR grant that was approved allowing us some, to do some similar work um, in parallel. And so once all these tools have been developed and parental material is identified, then we can move towards the final objective, which is developing varieties and cultivars for Minnesota. So this is the team of co-conspirators uh, as implicated in the grant. So we've got Bob, who somehow managed to make himself the ringleader. Uh, we've got Craig, who's already been really helpful in figuring out where and how to do these, these field evaluations. Uh, Waleed is going to be helping with some microscopy components. Uh, Aaron will hopefully be assisting on the breeding end. Um, we've got Pam Ishmael, who's the director of the Plant Protein Innovation Center. She's going to be helping with the protein characterization work. And then Nick and myself as the boots on the ground, so to speak. Okay, so now we'll dig in a bit more to the first objective, which is kind of where a lot of our energy is going right now. The original plan was to assess 25 varieties for their winter tolerance. Uh, so this year we'll be actually looking at 30. 16 of these come from Rebecca McGee, uh, who, as I mentioned before, she's based in Washington. We're also uh, a private company called Progene, which is also out in Washington. Rebecca mentioned Progene to us um, as a company which has done really good private pea breeding, and she's worked with them before. And after talking with them, they were willing to share a number of their varieties with us as well. Uh, and so they're giving us their most genetically diverse material that they can while also trying to make sure that it's going to be winter hardy enough to, you know, hopefully survive in Minnesota. Uh, and so these 16 varieties, I'll talk a bit more about where they're going, but they're currently being grown in two locations. And then we're also getting 14 other lines, which were obtained from um, a winter pea cover crop breeding group, which I think is based in North Carolina and it can maybe mention a little bit more about them. Um, but I was told that these 14 varieties that I'm getting for them were selected by farmers in Wisconsin, so they can hopefully also maybe survive here. And so these lines will be evaluated for establishment, growth habit, winter injury and survival, spring vigor, flowering time, biomass production, and seed yield. And as a component of this objective, we're planning on testing in whole uh, doing some testing on whole seedlings or detached leaves to assess freezing tolerance using controlled experimental conditions. And additionally, it may be possible to predict freezing tolerance using microscopy by examining the size of plant vasculature. Um, and so here, I think I'll let Nick take over. Are you here, Nick? Yep, I'm here. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to kind of talk about the different things we can evaluate in controlled conditions on plants. Um, and this is to really supplement um, our field evaluations. It's, of course, not a replacement, um, but it can really help. So winter hardiness, as many of us know, is genetically a really complex trait. Um, and it can't really be reliably measured year after year. Our every, every winter, or test winter, um, they can be highly variable. And like Steve mentioned, these legumes, these winter annual legumes are not that hardy compared to other brassica or um, grass cover crops. Um, so this is gonna be you know, a huge focus of ours. Um, so 
in general, it's just very difficult to get reliable estimates of, of winter hardiness in, a, in just one or two field trials. It, it can really require many, many years. Certain years like last year um, that are relatively mild, most accessions or genotypes will survive, whereas some years everything can die. And um, not only do you not get very meaningful data from that, you can also lose um, valuable resources um, in seed. So can you advance? Steve? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. So the last two years, we did have um, a field evaluation of winter pea. And I got to give credit to Adria Fernandez, who helped collect most of this data. And so this is a part of a national cover crop trial that um, Steve and Don had, had mentioned. And so this same material, um, approximately 20 different accessions, was evaluated. Um, in both northerly and southerly states. Northerly states include Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York, um, and Nebraska. So two years ago, the winter of 2018, 2019, um, we had a, a warm up in the middle of winter and we had a lot of snow and ice that melted um, and it resulted in a complete stand loss. So we weren't able to get any data there. However, last year, um, among the accessions we had, we saw, we saw good variation for winter survival. So the right figures um, on the top, the box plots represent winter survival. The higher, the higher on the y-axis, the higher the rates of survival. Um, and some of those were some clear, clear winners surviving at almost 100%. Um, and the figure below shows the dry matter biomass that was eventually harvest, harvested from those, I believe maybe around like the first week of June. So that biomass generally correlates with winter survival. So biomass is a very important trait for cover crops. And, and if we want biomass, um, that nitrogen fixation, ground coverage, weed suppression, we need winter survival. So you can go to the next slide, Steve. So something that we've been doing with Vetch for a few years now um, is indoor screening of freezing tolerance. Um, and we found that these methods correlate pretty well with, with actual field winter survival. However, there are a few caveats. Um, you know, this is a very simplistic environment, um, whereas in, in the real world, in the field, um, everything can affect freezing tolerance, the light intensity, the, the light quality, um, soil saturation. So, um, and also um, snow molds, for exa example, there are, there are cold loving pathogens. And you know, we can't really account for all of these in a controlled environment, um, but freezing tolerance um, is one of those main, main factors in winter hardiness. So this will be utilizing this as a supplement. So next slide. One tool that we're gonna utilize um, is chlorophyll fluorescence. And this has been used to assess um, plant stress to not just freezing tolerance, but also heat and salinity. And it, and it correlates pretty well. So we can detach leaves from frozen plants, um, measure the variable fluorescence over maximal fluorescence or FV over FM. And this is a measure of photosystem two efficiency. You know, how well is that leaf working after being subjected to stress? And so high levels, um, 0.8 of, of this FV over FM indicates a very healthy leaf. And so we looked at four different accessions um, to kind of begin with as checks, and they are Windham, Blaze, Granger, and Hampton. And those are ranked as far as known winter hardiness. So Hampton is a spring type. So we would assume in these tests, it's, it's gonna perform um, not well relative to the more winter hardy checks. And so we can see it on the, as we go across these columns, which are different acclimation treatments, different temperature treatments before freezing, we do see a decreasing gradient um, for this FV over FM. Um, so this, we could potentially use this um, to evaluate the leaf freezing tolerance. And so the top bar, that was a freezing test at negative 10, whereas the bottom bar was a test at negative 15. And at negative 10, 
um, all the plant leaves were perfectly healthy. So that really doesn't give us much information, though at minus 15 C, now we can start to parse things apart. So next slide. So there's also more whole plant measures of freezing tolerance, and these are a little more intuitive. Um, and it's as simple as, does a plant survive or die? Um, so on the left, we, we've looked at percent survival. Um, and these are the same treatments as the previous slide. Now, what's really interesting is that we're finding that the, the leaves of winter pea, they often are able to survive and look quite healthy after, um, let's say, a minus 15 C freezing treatment. However, if you look at the bottom of that picture there, you can see the crown um, or lower portion of the stem is just entirely desiccated. Um, and so apparently these, these plants can tolerate, you know, low ambient temperatures, um, but it's the ground temperatures, that temperature around the crown in the winter that is, that is really the most um, important thing in Minnesota winters. And so we're gonna have to be thinking about that when we think of, you know, what, what does this pea look like that's gonna survive Minnesota winters? And it's gonna have to have integrity of the crown. The figure on the right um, shows also the regrowth. Um, so not just does the plant survive, but um, is it a functional plant? Is it, it, is it, is it able to put on regrowth? Um, so we think with you know, these, these different metrics, we can kind of get, um, I guess, a better visual of freezing tolerance um, as it relates to field winter hardiness. Next slide. Now the last trait we're going to be looking at um, is the size of plant vasculature. And this is research that um, Waleed has focused on um, with winter barley and will now be um, looking at this with winter peas. And this trait has been associated or is pretty conserved among many plant species as a method of um, surviving or at least tolerating freezing conditions and ice within the plant itself. And so a smaller vasculature, um, smaller diameters, um, give a plant ability to um, tolerate these freezing stresses better. Um, and if Waleed would like to you know, chime in and talk more extensively about this, um, feel free, Waleed. Um, so we're hoping that with all these tools, um, we can more efficiently screen through um, germplasm um, for these traits. And this would be a kind of a method of selecting parents um, before just putting everything out in the field and potentially jeopardizing um, seed that could be um, in low supply. So that's all I have and I'll turn it back to Steve. Okay, thanks Nick. Yeah, so as you guys can see, winter hardiness is definitely gonna be, I think our biggest challenge and, you know, finding good effective ways to try and select for components of winter hardiness um, and maybe try to get early generation testing of that material is kind of our primary focus here. Um, but now we'll move on to one of our other objectives. So the second objective, objective of this work is to evaluate pea proteins and try to understand their functionality for different food uses. This is not really my area of expertise. Uh, and Ishmael is gonna be leading the charge on this component of the grant. Um, and so while our, our study only has um, the funds to do a few, examine a few varieties in depth, um, this work is highly synergistic with an FFAR proposal that was recently funded. And I think if I understand correctly, the aim of that uh, project is to develop more high throughput methods for predicting protein quality and functionality. And so I think they're, they're trying to use NIR and try to find components of NIR analysis that are highly correlated with uh, protein functionality. And so if this works, it'd be a much cheaper and much faster way of trying to predict the varieties uh, and use quality. And so that would allow us to test and select better parental materials and also um, progeny earlier in the breeding pipeline. And so that would obviously be really helpful um, for breeding. And so the final objective of the grant is to actually- Before you move on, George, do you have anything as a food scientist you want to say about the protein? If yeah, Pam isn't online? Expert. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Yeah, so at the Plant Protein Center, uh, led by Farm, of course, will be looking at what they normally would do is to how to ensure that the proteins from teas can be properly extracted and used for food application. So my guess is that's the same thing they'll be doing, so extracting the food protein and purifying it. You are looking at yield, you are looking at functionality. Now, you, my guess is now that you guys are trying to make it winter hardy, will it affect these functionalities and yield and characteristics of the food proteins when they are extracted for use in food applications? Like, will it be different from what we already know? So I guess that's what they'll be doing. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely imagine early on our spring peas are going to have better food um, protein in them because we're not having to also select for winter hardiness. Yeah, so you have more of the pea proteins will be the same way as the normal pea proteins will be made because that has always been a problem. Digestibility, is it digestible? If it's not digestible, it's very difficult for you to use them for beverages or use them for... <clears throat> so. Actually, I actually have a question. Sorry to interrupt our, um, the talk, uh, but actually, well, maybe I'll wait for later. I'll, I'll ask you a question at the end. Okay. Um, and so, There's okay. a question that just popped up here. Is there any correlation between cold, hardy, and fatty acid profiles? Um, I'm not sure about this. Um, we would probably have to find out, but yeah, I, I don't want to, I don't know whether Pam is doing any analysis on fatty acids. I would have to ask her and to see I what could, I could speculate on this. Um, I would imagine there are um, one mechanism in freezing tolerant species, um, something that's really affected by freezing and cold in general is the cellular membranes. And so plants that are, you know, adapted to freezing are able to kind of um, desaturate their, their cellular membranes to allow fluidity under, under cold temperatures. And so um, I'd imagine there is, but I, I really can't speak um, further on it. Yeah. Note that it was sent <clears throat> from um, uh, to us indicated that that's what Pam is finding in uh, in uh, I guess it was Pennycress, right? Yeah, I'll just chime in here and just say that yeah, this is something that we find in uh, Pennycress or in Pennycress, and I'm just indicating that that Pam uh, group was actually the group that did our our fatty acid analysis, and so. You guys are, are poised to, to look at that for your different accessions if you so desire. Yeah, I, I kind of thought that, you know, carbohydrate the composition would be a really big factor. I mean, because there's, that's like fructans and a lot of those sugars can be um, utilized by plants to improve freezing tolerance when they're under cold stress, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure it's a complex trait, as you mentioned. And, uh, fatty acid would just be one component, but it's one thing that we can easily see that when we knock out the, the, the lower the amount of polyunsaturated fatty acid from thinny crust, we do lose winter hardiness. So it's a, just an easy thing to look at. And it's something that you could look at for your accessions and see if there's any difference. Yeah, and, and we know for sure that <clears throat> to add on to what was said, we know for sure that in animals, for instance, like animals that live in very cold environment, like fish that live in cold uh, waters, they have a lot more uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So my guess is, we you may see you may see an increase in these uh, unsaturated fatty acids if, as you increase the winter hardiness. That's that's, but that's a, a, a bonus potential if from a health perspective, right? Because the polyunsaturated fats are the, the healthier? Yes, the, the, the polyunsaturated fats are the healthier ones, yeah. So maybe, maybe here, if I can uh, interject quickly, because uh, I know that Seth is looking at, uh, he has this uh, US-wide or at least uh, Midwest-wide map showing the protein and oil content in soybean and um, and this profile of amino acids is also dependent on temperature regimes. So you guys might, uh, might need to connect with him and get some insights on what he's thinking 
in terms of uh, the mechanism that explain the change in amino acid profile and seed composition as a function of, uh, of temperature, because this is a legume as well, and he's looking at those types of uh, uh, traits, and this is based on uh, farmers uh, field data. Maybe Aaron also knows more uh, about this as well, but I, I thought you might you might want to connect with him on these uh, these aspects. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, for all these comments and input, everyone. It's really helpful. All right, so let's continue. Um, so the final objective of this grant is to actually develop these varieties for Minnesota. And so obviously we've got some work to do before we can make progress on this objective. Um, but once we have selected parents and, um, you know, start making crosses, a tentative plan is to advance the material for a couple generations, either in the field or greenhouse, and then F23 families could subsequently be screened for cold hardiness using some of these methods that we've discussed. And from there, there's a number of possibilities that exist, you know, including in intermating superior early generation material, uh, doing more back crossing to elite lines or more inbreeding and selection. But I definitely say, you know, this aspect of the project is very tentative and the details still need to be kind of worked out, but we're just, we're just not there yet. And so now I can actually give you guys a brief update on things that we actually have done thus far. Um, so the biggest hurdle this year was just simply getting seed from collaborators and then getting in the ground. Um, in some cases, I got the seed about a week before planting, so that was fun. Um, but this year I had enough seed to plant at two locations, St. Paul and Lamberton. So here and here. Um, in each case, a randomized complete block design was used with either two, three, or four reps per location. And I'll explain more on that in a second. Um, we planted 15 foot rows at a hypothetical three inch depth, though this was done with a push planter. And so sometimes there's ridges in the field or the boot on the planter moves up on you. And so we'll see how this actually works out in reality. Um, in St. Paul, triticale was used as a companion crop to help catch snow and maintain snow cover during the winter. And that generally improves winter survival. Um, so, but due to a low number of seed, the lines from the cover crop breeding program that I got from North Carolina were, I had less seeds, so I only planted them in 10 foot long single rows. And so um, there's a 12 inch spacing between the peas and the triticale for them. And then for the 16 lines I got from Rebecca McGee or Progene, they were planted in 15 foot long two row plots with eight inch spacing between the triticale and them. And so just this diagram is kind of shows how the, the planter was set up and what the, the plots look like. The dark lines represent the peas and the light ones, the triticale. So this is the stuff from North Carolina. And then here's what it looked like for the stuff from, from Rebecca McGee and Progene. So I should have mentioned that there's two P rows here and then a space and then two rows of triticale. Uh, and then Lamberton is pretty much the same setup as the one you're looking at, two row plots, 15 feet long. Uh, but there they had winter rye instead of triticale. And the space between the winter pea and the rye was 12 inches because of the way their, their tractor was, their planter was set up. Uh, so in the future, I'd like to plant one or maybe two more locations. So Minnesota is a really big state and it experiences a lot of different kinds of winter stress in different regions. And, you know, we, I briefly mentioned that we're trying to join this um, pea breeding consortium. And I have this idea that we could be the place that people send their material to, to really adequately test for winter hardiness because we are the place that experiences it the most and with the most variety. Um, so, so that's something that I kind of hope to do in the future. And as Nick mentioned also from year to year, uh, winter stress is highly variable. So the more locations you can look at, the better. And so this is a picture from St. Paul location as of yesterday. It was planted on the 23rd of September and it might be kind of hard to see, but there's uh, the triticale coming up 
And there's also peas coming up as well. They're still small, just an inch or two tall at the moment. Um, and so here are the 16 lines that I got from Rebecca, McGee, and Progene planted in three reps. And then the stuff from the winter pea cover, cover crop breeding program in two reps. And then here's a picture from Lamberton just after I finished planting it. And I had enough seed and space there to do four reps. So one, two, three, four. And that's the, the same 16 lines I got from Rebecca McGee and Progene. So to date, uh, limited progress. Um, this is, sorry, I need to do that separately. Um, We've managed to secure germplasm and it's in the field waiting for winter to strike. So hopefully in the spring, we'll have something to actually discuss. Um, and controlled freeze tests are gonna be performed this winter. Some of the things Nick was talking about so we can see if we have these more high throughput reliable ways of screening germplasm. Um, and then the FFAR project that I mentioned, uh, that's set to begin this January. And once that's done, we can begin breeding. So that's it. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Forever Green Initiative for funding this work and the FFAR for funding the pea protein characterization work that Pam Ishmael at the Plant Protein Innovation Center is going to be doing. Uh, I'd like to thank Rebecca McGee from the USDA for donating both her germplasm and also her time mentoring Bob and I, <coughs> giving us a crash course at now Peaceburg. <clears throat> and then Progen for being a private company willing to share germplasm with us. And so that's it. Thanks to everyone for listening. I know it's kind of a short talk, but we're just starting. So um, I guess if anyone has any questions. Well, yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the team uh, for putting this all together. And, and I think this is an, a good example of how these teams develop, right? <laughs> This conversation's been going on for a number of years. Now we have a real team in place that are now making the connections out to uh, others in the country that are working around the same, same issues and finding resources that build the program, right? So just to remind everyone when we bring the Forever Green uh, teams together, uh, they're not just talking about funding that has come through Forever Green. It's basically the teams that are functioning under this continuous living cover um, cover umbrella. So it's not just specifically reporting on funding that came through for Evergreen. Uh, it's intended to basically lay out the progress that's being made. Maybe the initial funding came for Forevergreen or Forevergreen came in later, but it's the idea behind uh, these teams that are developing and starting, uh, starting to, to function. And I think this is just an, excellent example of a new emerging uh, team and looking for the connections and the funding uh, uh, sources uh, uh, behind it. So uh, yeah, that was really exciting to have this new team funded by FFAR, um, the federal resources coming uh, to, to the University of Minnesota and, uh, and, and into this, this program. I noticed that there was a, a question uh, from Carmen Fernholtz. Carmen, can you come on and, answer, and ask it? Yeah, I, I was just uh, wondering if you've come up with, because I thought we talked about this years back, uh, some correlation between uh, planting in the fall and winter survival, because I know years back we had done some work on the farm here, planting in August and thinking we'd get a better uh, survival and it appears and I think, Don, you and I talked about it. It appears that a later planting seems to generate better winter survival. Any further development on that? And depth of planting was also an issue. The time and depth of planting the, uh, the seed based on the positioning of that crown. Okay. Right. So, I mean, I, someone else, either Nick or I don't know if Craig's on, um, could probably talk to this better than I can. But I think that's definitely been observed with a number of crops that uh, this the later planting it actually is correlated with improved winter survival. Something about these young young seeds, they maintain this capacity to survive the stress. 
Um, I don't, I don't personally know what that mechanism is and I don't know if it's been worked out as well with peas, but there's definitely a lot of anecdotal evidence. Some of the people in the, the pea breeding consortium that I mentioned say that they are planting at a later date. And when I said I was planting in September, you know, September 23rd, some of them were saying that's maybe the earliest they thought I should plant. So, um, well, originally, I thought that was maybe the latest I should be planting, right? The, the dogma is normally late August, so. Nick, do you remember if Schaefer and your team did some planting date and, and, and depth, depth of planting? Uh, they did planting date. I believe this was uh, Craig and Adria Fernandez. And I think they maybe, I'm not sure how many planting dates they looked at. Um, they had pretty low survival across all treatments, but I think it, the later ones, I think, had slightly higher survival, if I could remember right. But just to add to what Steve said, um, yeah, this is, it's not necessarily intuitive. I, I had also assumed that early September would be better, um, and then collaborators had reached out where I believe it was a farmer in North Dakota they found best survival like the first, maybe the first week of October. And so the idea would be plant as late as you can, um, but you know, make sure you can get three to four inches of growth. Um, so it's interesting. You, you, yeah, you know, with, with which, which could be good because a lot of our, a lot of our summer annual crops are, are being harvested quite late. And so it might actually fit into that into these cropping systems better, um, but it may be at the expense of fall growth matter, um, like uh, our fall biomass for these cover crops. Um, but if that's what it takes for them to survive, you know, I think we have to we have to really consider that. Having worked in Rosa for a number of years, you know, uh, that's where a lot of the production of perennial ryegrass occurs and, and then perennial ryegrass, you know, has some issues with winter hardiness as well, but the lines that have been developed suck for with winter hardiness have been positioned in that Rosso environment where you have snow cover <laughs> and it usually doesn't melt in the middle of the winter, right? So it's an environment that I would love to see looked at pretty intensely because there's small grains in that system. You got you have stubble and early snowfall that uh, that stays in place um, well into you know early early spring. It may be that that is the type of environment uh, that the winter pea would do the best in, as compared to southern Minnesota, where you would lose that uh, that snow cover early and melt and standing water and those types of things. So I think the idea that you threw out there that Minnesota could be one of those places <laughs> to test the germplasm across the country that's being yeah. developed here in Minnesota to look at winter hardiness. I think we do have uh, a, uh, a series of experimental sites that would be a true test, a good test of this, uh, this germplasm. Right? Yeah, I mean, we've got great outreach centers, you know, research and outreach centers yeah. all around the state. We've got a lot of geographic and, you know, climatic yeah. information, so. And there's uh, these micro sites too, right? Like Rosso and uh, and the Magnuson Research Farm that's that, that's there. So I just want to throw that one out so we don't forget that uh, that that unique site up there. Well, when you yeah. when you were planting wheat and rye and anything uh, or, or grains, were you interseeding or were you planting them separate? Because I'm thinking. And interseeding uh, in the fall would provide much more protection for the peas themselves because they, the the growth of the small grain would be covering the peas. And I don't. How have you done that? You want to? Uh, so this, yeah, Nick. Why don't you go? Okay. Yeah, we we've, we've been seeding them essentially at the same time, um, but in with, separate with, rows in separate rows, um, but, you know, but with different pieces of equipment, um, we just, we right now don't have a, a way to, in the future we hope to, but right now we don't have a way to plant this, the triticale or whatever winter cereal 
um, with the legume rows at, at the same time. Um, but Carmen, I, I think you're exact, exactly right. Um, I think having some sort of interceding or, or companion with, with the legumes will help. But yes, you, we, we have with vetch, for instance, we had uh, maybe it was winter wheat that totally overgrew <laughs> and fell on top of the vetch and then, you know, the vetch died, so. Okay. The question kind of also goes to something Don was talking about. I mean, this is, this is a team, right, that's trying to work together to address a number of problems, but there's also the question of the agronomy side of this. You know, we're trying to do this breeding program, um, but there's a lot of questions in terms of the basic agronomy of how to grow winter pea in Minnesota. You know, it's not really been grown here much before, so what's the best practice? And, you know, that's a, probably going to be a moving target as we get more winter hardy varieties, but that's also work that would be helpful. Yeah, Stephen, that's why it makes us a classical forever green team, right? All the way from basic genomics to food science, plant breeding and agronomy in between. So this, this is a perfect example of uh, one of those teams. You can't make progress. You can't put that end product in the, in the marketplace unless you have all those pieces functioning together in, a, in an organized way. Yeah. There was another question that uh, that came up. Can someone pick it up? Yeah, that yeah. I was just wondering, Nick, you know, about you've done your controlled experiments to evaluate cold tolerance. Um, I can't remember in what crops you were talking about, but I'm just curious how important you think the reacclimation period is in Minnesota. Like, I don't grow anything over the winter, so I don't know. But if you have these deacclimation events where it gets really warm, does it take time to go back to, you know, average to cold temperatures? Do you think the plants have enough time to reacclimate? Yeah, this is a, this is a really good question. Um, you know, we're seeing m maybe more climate variability and um, we're seeing it in the winter and we showed how that could affect survival, but the variability in the autumn, let's say, you know, if you have a week of November temperatures that are, you know, the, in the 60s, and then you have a cold snap the next day. Um, yeah, I think I think that ability to reacclimate after a warm spell is is um, very important. But it's also, you know, important for these genotypes to maybe not deacclimate, um, you know, to these higher temperatures um, if they can if they can wait. And you know, I think there's um, you know, bits of dormancy that may be happening and that can be good or bad, let's say in late spring um, when we do want things to take off. Um, but I, I think it's really important to consider. Um, with my experiments, I looked at one week of cold acclimation followed by one week of deacclimation, followed by one week of reacclimation. So these time periods are somewhat long um, because plants can change even within 24 hours um, in response to cold or warm temperatures. Um, so I think my work really brings up a lot of questions, but you know, I don't, in my experiments, we don't quite have the resolution of the rates of these changes, um, but, it, but it'll be very interesting um, I think, and, and should definitely be, you know, thought of, you know, with the development of these winter annual crops. So, great can question. I in, can I help in there real quick too? So, I also, I did some similar work for my PhD, but with oats, um, and I kind of saw a lot of the same things Nick saw. And so I think uh, reacclimation after deacclimation does take time. And I think the way you know, usually when you have these deacclimation events, they're usually followed by, in, you know, in the field, they're usually followed by a cold snap, and they usually don't have the time to reacclimate. And so I think that not deacclimating in the first place is definitely um, the most important thing. And I think there tends to be variation for that that can be selected for. Yeah, and even just adding another point to that, um, you know, in, in my experiments, I kept photo period constant once it once the plants cold acclimated. Um, so you know we see that plants are very responsive to temperature, um, but perhaps we could make them a little bit more responsive to just 
um, just photo period. And so maybe photo period alone could be um, enough of a, a signal to um, either, either tell plants to just, you know, hold on and bundle up or take off. Um, so. I agree, because I also think, um, you know, if you're talking about fall and or autumn deacclimation events versus maybe spring uh, deacclimation events, those could potentially be different. Um, but I don't know much about the phenology of, of P. So, but might, that might be something interesting to look at. All right, this is George here. I was just wondering whether you guys were looking at anything about the carbohydrates. You did mention the fructans and all that. I only had P protein and protein and protein. What about the carbohydrates? Uh, well, we're not, we're not really examining the carbohydrate component much. Um, it's not really a part of this grant. George, are you suggesting it should be looked at in the seed? Yes, I think the carbohydrates should also be looked at. Pea protein is known to have a lot of amylose, and so it will be interesting to see how all this winter hardiness induction into the pea. Protein. So, George, we give you full permission to do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah, I, I do work on carbohydrates in my lab, and I thought it would be something interesting to look at. Uh, are you adding funding to that for me to do it, or you just want me to do it? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll drop off five hours later today. Yeah. So I, I, okay. Right. I think it'll be something worth looking at too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. This is the reason for these conversations, right? Is to continue to provide input and identify those areas that need the investigation from the genomics all the way through the food science. So this is, yeah. is a great conversation today. So and again, you know, it's the food science basically giving the ideas to the plant breeders and things that they, that relationship needs to be uh, built off of and, and looking at proteins, looking at the carbohydrates that have value in the marketplace, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one other uh, comment that came from Scotty was, and Scotty uh, Wells was indicating the issue of interceding and those things came up and basically what he's saying is, it appears that he probably has the equipment that could do what Carmen is saying, right? And uh, and doing the planting of that mixture and those types of things. So. I'm fully for any system where I don't have to use the push planter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would be great. I think Scotty just volunteered to, to push the push planter. <laughs> no, th what I'm saying back to you guys, this is where we figure out where who has the equipment, right? And you guys were doing things last minute. And uh, again, people are coming forward and saying, we have the equipment that uh, we'd be able to be used to do, to put these systems in place. And, and again, that's the value of these, these meetings, right? And, and I might mention, I've got a state-of-the-art uh, grain drill that would work perfect for, for interceding. Uh, uh, it's a no-till drill, so you, you'd get a really uniform depth with this piece of equipment. So I'm willing to work with the team as well and even put a plot here on the farm if that's something that would be something in the future for you guys. Who was that? Sorry, I couldn't see who was talking. That, that was Carmen Fernholz. Okay. Yeah, uniform depth I think is going to be profoundly important for trying to get regular winter survival, like uh, uniform winter survival assessments. Right, so the crown is the most important thing for these young plants to survive. Well, those of you that haven't worked with Carmen, he can be a reliable collaborator once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I have a question, uh, I have a comments. Uh, I will start with my question. So I'm the new alpha breeder, several um, probably most of you already know me by the meeting. Uh, I'm planning my alfalfa breeding program, selecting germplasm from uh, over 7,000 uh, germplasms. And uh, I'm trying to select <coughs> the number of germplasms that represent, represent the diversity of Minnesota and also Minnesota area needed. 
And then come out uh, like 300 to 500. I talk to Debbie. I say, how much I can test? I want to test uh, 1,000. So here, we, uh, I see we select with 30, if I uh, understand correctly. So how do you optimize or decide this magical number start with 30? That's my first question. And then uh, my comment says, uh, as to the winter uh, survival rate, uh, I also uh, start uh, build the products or work on the products, collaborate with North, State Carol uh, North Carolina State University using stress cam. You may heard about stress cam is we use a camera. Uh, for example, the GoPro, we monitor the plants uh, real time, take images, and I got uh, artificial uh, intelligence product, uh, a smaller product, product to support using uh, the remote image and take image and uh, send the image data back to the cloud or computer you can decide how soon you take an image, uh, change the angle, et cetera, to select uh, the most uh, winter tolerance or to just uh, start a collaboration. Yeah. Uh, I see the potential usage for the peak here also. So that's my comments and back to the question. How, how do you find the magical number 30 term plot for the peak? <laughs> yeah, it's not a scientific answer. It's that's what uh, collaborators had available for us. Um, so there was a, a real fight to get a hold of germplasm, especially relatively modern elite stuff that um, people thought would survive in Minnesota. And for P, that's pretty limited pool. And so they tried to get us the most diverse, you know, lines they could that they thought would survive. And so that total came out to 30. I see. Small. It's a small founding population, to be sure. Um, uh, and, and also, we go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, once we have something that can, you know, maybe start to survive Minnesota and is proven, then you can work diversity back in. But we, that's the kind of the first, the first goal. You know, get our foot in the door in Minnesota. I see. As to the experiment uh, design, so you prefer to choose four locations. And uh, also, is there any preliminary data to show the variation needed, how many number of locations the reps are needed, and to design, uh, to select the optimal number of locations, uh, uh, optimal number for uh, uh, reps, and also the plot set, et cetera. Do you do we have any data in Minnesota area? So uh, the way I laid it out, it wasn't based on um, any empirical method of determining locations. I mean, my my knowledge and experience is that it's better to have more locations with fewer reps than more reps with fewer locations. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And. Uh, in terms of where, how I chose the two locations that it's at right now, um, that was, you know, in talking with Craig Schaefer and getting input on who he thought, what, what places we thought we could get good help getting the fields prepped and uh, who had uh, the planters and machines who could help us this year, you know, um, we were getting kind of down to the line and so the, the first goal was to get the seed and get it in the ground, you know, and in the future, in terms of, you know, I put four locations, I think maybe more might be better. It really, I think the most important thing is trying to tap all the different kind of regional climactic variation that Minnesota gets okay. um, to assess all these different kinds of winter stress. So like the Northeast is very different than the Northwest, which is different than the Southwest, which is different than the Southeast. Uh, and in terms of the, of the state, you know, where maybe there is another location that could fall in there. I'm not sure if it would be necessary or not. I, I like uh, your objective three, since I'm a breeder. How many years of this product uh, last? And uh, I, I wonder what is all the come from objective, 
objective three as to the plasms or culture, etc. It's three or five years or how many years? Oh, how long do we think it could take? Oh. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, this, this product, uh, how many years got founded? Aaron, are you, are you on right now? No. Uh, so Aaron is the, the experienced breeder. I mean, I'm a breeder by training, but I have limited actual experience in developing varieties, but I think it's going to take some time. You know, um, the reality is that once we, once we identify parental material, we have to make crosses, then we have to do rounds of inbreeding. It's, and it's going to take 10 to 15 years. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, I, I mean, how, how many years we are, the product will support, will be supported for this product? The project is only funded for two. And okay. realistically, five would be pretty fast, fast turnaround to develop a new variety. Is yeah. that from, from ground zero? But I, but I would say is, you know, that's what we've worked on in, in the context of the Four Evergreen Initiative. And one should not just look at it as a grant program or, or a project granting program. Uh, the, we've been able to present to a number of granting agencies, including the Minnesota legislature and the Clean Water Council, that none of this is going to happen if the funding is only for a short period of time. So the intent of the Forever Green Initiative is to help provide continuity for these programs, not to fund it all, but to make sure that as you bring plant breeders into a program, and you're not going to be able to bring in your best scientist if it's only a, a small grant, right? So the Forever Green Initiative yeah. is designed to be the platform uh, to make sure that there is some continuity over, over time. And I think we've been able to convince uh, some of our supporters uh, for this program that that is the most important piece, is continuity in, um, in, the, in the program. And that's the reason I raised it earlier. Don't look at Forever Green just as a grant program. <laughs> it's a platform to, to try and maintain continuity uh, for each of these teams over a long enough period of time to produce products. Well, and so the question- Thank you. Yeah, I thought that question I mean, to the good point, right? Because it's, you know, we have currently two years of funding, but the goal is to develop a longer term breeding project. Yeah. But, Right. You know, there's a lot of growing interest for pea protein and plant protein in general. There's this international or this uh, pea breeding consortium that we're trying to get together. Um, and so I think there's a lot of potential ways we could start bringing other sources of revenue into it. Yeah, yeah. just for those of you that are still online, you know, the idea of you know, these, these teams have been developed uh, that are under this Forever Green umbrella, not all funded obviously through Forever Green entirely. Um, but over the last 12 months, uh, in terms of these teams and their partners across the country, these teams have brought in $77 million wow. in terms of support for these projects. Obviously, not all of that comes to Minnesota, but it's going to the, the connections that uh, these teams have made across the, across the country. So. Uh, we are now in a position where our peers are recognizing that this is a concept to to invest in and are encouraging granting agencies, whether it's USDA, Department of Energy, uh, the state legislature here in Minnesota, um, or foundations, that this is a concept uh, uh, to, to invest in. Thank you, Donald. That's the reason I asked the question I want to my voice be heard as a breather. I hear you say continuous uh, support. Yeah, you know, in other words, in, in good conscience, I could not over the last number of years have uh, tried to pull these teams together uh, if I didn't have some confidence that the funding agencies that we were, we were working with were looking at it as a, as a long-term investment, right? Great. So we've made some progress in that, in that direction. But you know, the, the world is ever changing and it's uh, always a continual battle <laughs> uh, to, to make sure that there are resources uh, that, are, that are in place. One other thing I just wanted to mention here that, that came up in terms of um, Waleed's work. 
in terms of winter hardiness. And I think that's the other exciting thing that's coming in that we look across these uh, cropping, these, these crop teams and one area that's been identified as something to focus on is winter hardiness. <laughs> so the team that's coming in uh, together not only works on winter pea, but on barley and certainly other, other crops that are under development and, and developing a basic research framework around the development of uh, winter hardy crops for, for the upper Midwest. And so I, that's another, I think, unique outcome it's not a standalone team, but maybe it will be, but it's a team that is emerging across uh, these, uh, these, these various, various crops. And we have some uh, great scientists that are coming on board, new minds coming in to help think through this, this uh, 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 winter hardiness bottleneck <laughs> that's faced uh, the upper Midwest for, for a number of years. So. So special thanks to Steve and Nick.